as she mentioned, my name is Nick Patch. I, my Twitter username is Nick Patch, if you want to get in touch with me. And I'm an internationalization engineer at Shutterstock in New York City, I, where I'm happy we could uh, sponsor the conference this year. Uh, this is my third time at Open Source Bridge, and I'm excited to be talking with you, you here today about, namely, about names. And, well, a lot of people don't realize that there are many people with names out there that have a lot of trouble with our software. Let me turn the mic on. Check, check. Okay. So, many people throughout the world have had trouble their whole lives using our software, so inputting their names. There are issues with user input, validation, storage, and display. And the Two main issues here are unintentional bugs and uninformed decisions. So a lot of us, when we're testing software, whether we're developers just testing what we've built, writing unit tests, uh, QA or SDED engineers, well, we're using the data that's familiar with us, uh, to us, the names that are familiar to us. And if we're Westerners, they're probably very Western names we're inputting. And then, commonly, we just don't find problems that are built into our software and have the opportunity to fix them before releasing. Or I writing massive systems that have been maintained for years and not supporting your users. Unfortunately, most of us don't have input devices to easily enter international data. This, for example, is a keyboard I've never seen on a developer's uh, workstation, which is Icelandic and conveniently supports Icelandic, Norwegian, Swedish, Danish, Finnish, and many Western European languages. I like to call this the Feyerty keyboard. Even less likely to find on a developer's workstation is this keyboard here with a tie. Um, I would love to use this. It would provide great security for my computer. Nobody would know what to do when they approach it and it's unlocked. You would have to type a complex series of control characters to type any sort of ASCII. It would uh, turn the tables a little bit. Does anyone know what this is? This, this specifically is Japanese, and it means mojibake. Or as I like to spell it. <laughs> and it's a term that's been adopted for just corrupted characters. I say sometimes it's when you have characters in one encoding and you display it in another encoding. The classic problem is strings in Latin 1, or Windows uh, uh, CP, oh, I can't remember the name. Anyway, displayed in UTF-8, where UTF-8 is now the prominent encoding around the world online. But well, there's a lot of data in Latin 1. And then there's vice versa. Some programming languages and applications, by default, presume you've got Latin 1, but most people are now providing UTF-8. And many people just don't catch these issues. I, it can be, and even when they do catch them, they catch them in their unit tests, they, they test for them, they think they're all good. They can put in the input, and they can get out the output. They verify it. Well, their application also prints things. It prints labels or lanyards. And a lot of people don't test those, because it's harder to test your printed output. Let's say I, I collected some examples on Twitter because I, well, a lot of people experience these problems. And fortunately for our talk, they, I, I like to I display them on, on Twitter for our examples here. Some of uh, I, you know um, her for, I, with this example of UTF-8 or UTF, WTF. <laughs> I, some people. 
live their lives with a variety of different character encoding. Here's all shipping labels. Here's a different issue. I don't even know how that happened. And yet another problem. Yes, in 2015. Now, this one, wait, this one's handwritten here. Somebody hand wrote Mojibaki in Cyrillic, sent it from Paris to Russia, and the Russian Postal Service decoded this and delivered it to the proper address. <laughs> then what about lanyards? This, this is, is a, an example where we are printing it out and giving it to someone to wear around their neck and identify with everyone at the conference. And you know, I use, most of these examples are applicable to any sort of user input. But I'm using the, I, the examples all with names, because these are all our personal identity. And it's so important to get them right. So uh, Joel from France, he's experienced this before at multiple conferences. I actually, I, I found this humorous because I know Stephen Loomis, who he tweeted to, who's a member of the Unicode Consortium. <laughs> and then I actually know one of the respondents here, I, pro monger uh, Olivier from Paris, I points out that his Mojipaki fight started when he was born because of the letters in his name. Even open source bridge, but fortunately, this was caught early. <laughs> and then there are examples of validation, where the Department of Homeland Security requires you to enter your name as your passport displays it, but then rejects your name. Or when they corrupt your name on input <laughs> into non-alphabetic characters and then reject it because it's not alphabetic. So with all of these, I can't tell you exactly what to do to fix your applications because there's so many places that it can go wrong. The, my main point is test from the beginning. Find them out from the beginning and then stop them before they're in production. But if they are in production, hunt them down and uh, squash the bugs. I, oftentimes, you have to figure out how to properly work with Unicode data in your programming language. And well, we could give a talk on each different language on Unicode support. In fact, I have for Perl before. And I've started this GitHub repository called Unicode Programming under my username, Patch. This shows examples in many different programming languages. I, PHP, Python, JavaScript, R, Perl, Julia. I'm on all different tasks that you would want to perform with Unicode. Input, output, uh, regular expressions, sorting of your strings properly. Anyway, there's a lot more to add to it as well. So I invite contributors or requests for what you would like to see in here. Now the, the next few examples will take a, little, uh, take a little knowledge of how Unicode is laid out. So, with Unicode, there are three encoding forms. UTF-8, which we're all using. UTF-16, which is pretty common. You see it in a, the, it's the internal representation of strings in Java, JavaScript, Python. And UTF-32, which you don't see that much. But regardless of the encoded form, we have a large set of characters. I specifically code points that are laid out in a number of tables. And each one receives one uh, code point value, which is generally represented in, in hex form. And there are 17 planes that these characters are distributed among. The first one is the basic multilingual plane, the BMP. And then all the rest are various uh, supplementary planes they are zero base index, so zero through 16. And it turns out a lot of software 
even some programming languages, have trouble with non-BMP characters. So everything in plane 1 through 16. The reason being that the UTF-16 encoding requires one 16-bit code unit, that's two bytes, for any of the BMP characters. But it requires two 16-bit code units, that's four bytes, I, for any of the non-BMP char characters. Those are surrogate pairs. And some systems consider those to be two characters, when really they're just half a character each. Then in UTF-8, all of the characters in the BMP are either one, two, or three bytes, whereas all the characters outside of the BMP are four bytes consistently. So where will we have problems? MySQL, this one I've dealt with a lot. MySQL, long ago, introduced the UTF-8 character encoding, which you'd think would let you store UTF-8 data. <laughs> I was wrong. It actually lets you represent BMP characters, one through three byte characters. Once you attempt to insert a four byte character, it truncates starting at that character and you lose all the data after it silently. MySQL loves to do these things. So not only are you corrupting those characters, you're corrupting everything and you're, you're losing it. Well, fortunately in 2010, they released UTF-8 MB4, which is their attempt to fix UTF-8 by allowing the four byte characters as well as all the others. It's a superset. It's relatively easy to upgrade to, but there are some caveats related to indexing, so I recommend reading up on it first, but I recommend always using UTF-8 MB4 instead of UTF-8, especially if it's for any user input data, because this is real world data, you're gonna see it, uh, and it's gonna start making you lose all your characters. I, Matthias Bynans has a great blog post on doing this, and I'm going to share it in the notes as well as tweet about it later. Then JavaScript. <laughs> so who of us here uses MySQL and or JavaScript in any of the applications they have anything to do with? <laughs> OK, almost everyone in the room. So we all have to deal with these issues. JavaScript uses. I, you might say it uses UTF-16 as its uh, internal encoding form for its strings, but it's really UCS-2, which was a precursor to the standard and didn't have these surrogate pairs. All of the, uh, the characters were within the BMP at the time, and you could easily just represent them with a uh, two or one 16-bit code unit. Well, since that expanded long, long ago, I but the JavaScript standard hasn't been updated for this. It makes it very difficult to work with non-BMP characters because JavaScript considers them two characters. If you were to do a regular expression match against a string containing non-BMP characters using the dot in the regex that matches one character, it would actually match half. So you could extract half of a character when you meant to extract five characters. Maybe you extracted actually four and a half characters. Um, and it's something to pay attention to. There are improvements in ECMAScript 6, which are not in any of the current implementations out there yet, such as a Unicode mode for regular expressions. So it's something that we need to pay attention to when we're validating and extracting data or munging strings in any way. That, and it's important to use non-BMB characters for that as examples. And I've got a lot of people asking, OK, we know that this doesn't support the non-BMB characters, but why should we care about this? Like, what are our users actually inputting them? And don't tell me emoji, because it is true that almost all emoji and all new ones added in the last few Unicode versions are non-BMP. So they do provide good, easy examples to test. Unfortunately, well, fortunately and unfortunately, the only reason a lot of people 
even talk about this lack of support is because of emoji, not because of real world data and people's names and such, but at, at least it gets people talking about it. And I, right now I'm presenting a list that was compiled by a Dr. Ken Lunde of I, Adobe who wrote CJKV information processing because he provided a great list of like why you should support non-BMP characters. So Japan's Joyu Kanji standard requires one of them, which uh, behold, it's right there. This is the 2,136 uh, Japanese ideographs that you learn through secondary school. So this just shows that these are real world characters that people are using. Additionally, there's a uh, Japanese industry standard of characters used in business. And there are 303 of these non-BMP characters. I was collecting them to show you, but there's surprisingly little English resources. I was having to go to pages like this Japanese Wikipedia page to collect them. I, and I'm continuing to do that in order to provide a repository of real world names and user data, which I'll share with you. Then there's a Chinese government certification for software to be used in mainland China. I, and that requires six non-BMP characters as well as I, China's common set of Hanzi characters, which has 196. And Hong Kong, I, there's a standard for common Hong Kong I, Chinese characters, and there's a large 1,702 non-BMP ones. So obviously, this is very important for East Asia. If you're doing I, business in East Asia, but also many users want to represent their name especially on, say, social networks and places where they're going to communicate with uh, their uh, peers and friends in the way that they prefer to represent their name as opposed to a Latinized version of it made for your systems or for uh, doing business in the Western world. So it's very important to support these. In addition, just modern uh, operating systems and applications already support the BMP, so users are going to be inputting them, especially, you know, as I mentioned, with emoji as well. And as of Unicode 6.0, several years ago, there are more characters outside the BMP than in it. The BMP is effectively full. We're not adding new blocks into the BMP. There are some blocks that have additional space for more characters, such as the tie block. We can add, I think, uh, somewhere between 12 and 18 new tie characters. Well, if we wanted to add more of those to Unicode, we would have to create a tie extension block, and that would be outside of the BMP. So as we add more characters, it's just growing and growing what is outside of the BMP. And it should be considered just a, a business and personal priority to support these. So I've got a coworker on, a, on the search team with me. Her name's Ivy. And she said that she had trouble representing her name in some software. So she sent her name to me. This is it. And sometimes she uses uh, her Latinized name. Sometimes she uses this. So I took a look. I was wondering uh, what, what could be the problem with this. And she told me that th this is what she sees sometimes. I, some people in the, the localization community refer to this character as a tofu. I, there was a good talk a few years ago at the Internationalization in Unicode conference about getting rid of the tofus. Uh, although I, I, I find tofu delicious. But, so I looked at these, and I suspected maybe it's a non-BMP character. She told me that it was a rare character. And here are the hex uh, values for these code points. We can tell right away that this is all in the BMP, and here's how. If it's four or less hex digits, it's in the BMP. If it's five or more, it's outside. So what's the problem with this? It was actually a font issue. It's a very rare uh, character, and there are a lot of fonts that just don't provide a glyph for it. So that even goes to show testing your fonts out. Although fortunately with uh, web fonts and fallback fonts in modern browsers, it's less and less of an issue. But it's still something that people experience. And it's not just uh, 
non-BMP characters or various Unicode characters, it's also punctuation, which can be very valid in people's names, such as this uh, Hawaiian name, which has a Hawaiian okina in it, or uh, this Swedish name. You can have colons in Swedish names. It's, it's very common I, as a common abbreviation. And you'll see the colon in the middle of the word. So we see in right there, well, I've seen so much validation that just looks for punctuation and rejects it. And that will corrupt a lot of people's names. I mean, we all know people with names like, with Irish names like O'Reilly and such. And I've talked to some people with Irish names who commonly have problems with these. And you'd be surprised because they're just such common American names. And here even, an exclamation point, as listed on the State Bar of California, this is a, a lawyer who practices law in California, Darren QX Bean, exclamation point. <laughs> but hey, is it that rare to have an exclamation point in your name? I mean, we've got a lot of businesses like Yahoo, Yum Brands, against me. I was at uh, Yapsi, North America, the Pearl Conference two weeks ago in Salt Lake City, and I spoke with one attendee, Yakov, who has an ASCII apostrophe in his name. So he's got an ASCII character that he just has so much trouble with his name. And I was happy that he shared all of these examples of real world corruption of his name. This is actually a Hebrew name that's been Latinized, and you use the uh, ASCII hyphen in it. So first off, sometimes people attempt to escape it so they can have it in their JSON or wherever. But then they escape it on the output as well. Or you'll see it with the HTML entity escapes. And in this example, normally, they're actually going and escaping that ampersand again, so it's double escaped. Some people just strip it out. They're like, oh, no, no, that's not a real name character. In some, he actually said some truncate starting at the character. Yeah. So yeah, this was a Pearl conference. And he was very happy to hear when I told him that I, Pearl 6 actually supports his name and identifiers <laughs> as used in this variable. And it's not just the characters used where you're limiting your users in what they can display as their name. It's also the input boxes. So here's an example that I like. This is my Twitter profile. And they just provide a box because there are people with legal names that just have one word to their name. There are people with legal names that have three or more significant words to their name. And it can be very difficult, especially for international users, to split their name into a Western system, try to understand it, and input it. I GitHub as well, they do the right thing. Many of the places I, I looked at, they're like, OK, first name, last name, which can be very difficult. What's even more difficult, though, is first name, middle initial, last name. You'd think that offering one more box makes it easier. But really, middle initial is a very Western concept. Not only is it a very Western concept, it's a very American concept. The British will understand the fact that you are asking for a middle initial, but they'll consider it an Americanism. And I guess people like developers, data analysts, they like to work with data. They like to cut it up into nice little pieces and do things with it. I, I guess my main point is that we also need to be respectful to our users. We need to provide a natural experience to our users and not limit them based on what we want to do with their data for analytics and marketing purposes. Additionally, oftentimes people take portions of a name programmatically and use that to address people. They'll just put, they'll say hello and you know, take a portion of your name or try to put a title in front of the name. And that is even, that, that's munging international names even more, I, let alone other aspects of just what pe how people like to be addressed. I take Portuguese and Spanish names. Well, you have 
two word commonly, you have two last names, where the significant one is the second to last name, where if you were to say, I address someone by their last name, you would use the second to last one. So if you just programmatically took the last one, that wouldn't be how someone would like to be addressed. The main way around this is to not do it programmatically. Ask people how th what they like to be called, and then call them that. If you're sending email to them, they'll appreciate that. And then there are even issues with legal names. I liked this tweet a lot. Um, what it comes down to is a lot of places request your legal name when they don't really legally need your legal name. Don't ask for someone's legal name unless it's a legal requirement. And when you do, ask also for what they like to be referred to. Because many people, even though they know they have to work in their legal name in some situations, don't associate with it or identify with it and would prefer to be addressed by another name by, say, customer service or you know, emails or just addressing you when logging in. So here's the repo I mentioned. I've collected some examples. It's still a very early project. I, internationalization testing, that's I18N testing, I have my a patch on GitHub. As, as I mentioned, it's an early project. I'm actively collecting more examples for this. I'm going to expand it with the, BM, the non-BMP characters that I talked about. And I'd appreciate uh, any pull requests from anyone else. I, I, one thing that's important about this is it's not just listing these, but it's saying, I, it's giving references. Because if you are testing your applications and saying, okay, well, we don't support this name, and then there, you have to convince stakeholders in your project to support that name, I've had a hard time doing that without showing real-world references of people actually using these names. And then they're like, OK, OK, we have to support that. So that's part of this project as well, and specifying exactly what characters we're talking about. Uh, some aspects I included are even casing. Well, a lot of people have specific casing in their name that is not title cased where every name has a capital at the beginning and lowercase throughout. And if you arbitrarily recase their name, well, then you're corrupting their name. Uh, sometimes I've even seen this where there's punctuation within the name, such as O'Brien. Oh, wait, O'Brien, they do case it right after that. But you know, punctuation within a name, such as Yakov there, where then they will go and capitalize the character right after the punctuation. Pretty much any time when you're recasing, that's, that's a no-no. Just let the user put in what they like and display it back to them. In most cases, it will, in almost all cases, it's going to be how they display their name, so there's no need to recase it. I've seen this happen a lot on, with front-end developers, where they use uh, some of the CSS functionality to do title casing. And oftentimes, I have to come back and say, no, we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't do that with our translations as well, because other languages have common rules on casing. Where English, we like to title case most words, except for articles and prepositions. Many other languages, including French and many European languages, they don't like to go so casing heavy, except for German. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is Unicode usernames. This is identifiers, as used to identify yourself on a system and to display in your URL, such as on Twitter, nowadays on Facebook, and in a lot of places. So Unicode usernames can open a whole can of worms. If you arbitrarily go and just let people input whatever they want as a username, I, there can be security concerns coming up. I'm very supportive of letting users I supply a username non-ASCII, because just so many people in the world don't identify with Latin ASCII characters. But there are a few things you need to think about first. Fortunately, the Unicode Consortium has standards on Unicode identifiers and Unicode security, which I'll, I'll, sh I'll supply those in the notes. And they make it much easier for implementing Unicode usernames. They provide a default set of identifier characters that you can just say, OK, I'm going to support these in my usernames. 
so you don't come up with things like left to right and right to left marker issues where then you're changing the entire interface of the application outside of just your username and various control characters like that. Then there's a case folding, where oftentimes we want usernames to be unique uh, and different cases not to be unique. So I, sometimes people say, OK, let's lowercase everything for comparison or uppercase everything for comparison. Well, Unicode characters can change in ways that don't have round trip compatibility when going from lowercase to uppercase, such as the German sharp S. German sharp S capitalizes to uppercase S, uppercase S, two ASCII characters. And if we were to take an uppercase version and compare it, so uppercase upper, S, uppercase S, and compare it to the lowercase version of German sharp S, well, those would be considered different, when really we'd want them to be considered the same. So there's Unicode case folding, which actually considers all of these things, and a lot of programming languages have this functionality. Check out the Unicode programming project that I talked about for examples in languages. Normalization. There are different nor uh, normalization forms for the same canonically equivalent strings. So it's important to normalize before storing, or at least before comparing, your uh, usernames. Then there are confusable characters, characters that are entirely different. They have different meaning and semantics but the glyphs look the exact same, which can be very confusing and you may want to avoid, as well as mixed scripts. You know, sometimes if you're mixing Cyrillic and Latin in one username, it can be confusing. You can have those confusable characters where the glyphs look the exact same. So there's benefit in blocking mixed scripts, I, but still allowing entirely Cyrillic or entirely Latin usernames. And fortunately, we don't have to make all of this up. We don't have to go and in in investigate how to do this because there are Unicode standards on it, which I'll share in the notes. The main point I want to bring across here is a lot of people try to do validation to prevent fake data. But preventing fake names is not worth discriminating against real users. And if you know, your users, your clients, your customers, your community, I, normally, they are supplying data genuinely, and we should not be blocking them. So one last thing I wanted to mention is in the original description, I had I mentioned I, gender and pronouns in here as well. Well, I presented this I, at the last conference and realized, wow, wow, I put a lot in the original description. We could go over multiple sessions. And I'm happy to hear that we are going over multiple sessions. In this room next, <coughs> Finn and Jonathan are going to have a presentation on um, user input of uh, gender. And I am going to attend that, and I'm excited to. But I, let, does anyone have questions for this talk? Well, thank you very much, everybody.